Uh, should, I, should I start right now, or do you give me a, a signal? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, when I came for the first time to Vilno, it was in 1919. I was eight years old. And uh, I came from a deep province, from the center of Lithuania. Uh, Vilno seemed to me a big city. Uh, though at that time, okay. And if I could just ask you to try to, if if you could try to maintain some some eye contact to talk to me as much. Okay, okay, uh, but I do not see you. That's the trouble. Ah, it's dark. <laughs> Well, when I came first time to Vilno, it was 1919. I was eight years old. I came from a very deep province in the center of Lithuania. That's where is my birthplace. And uh, Vilno make the impression of a big city upon me. Though at that time, uh, it has, it preserved many features of a uh, Russian garrison town. Uh, and it was quite primitive. For instance, sidewalks were mostly wooden and cobblestone, round cobblestone in the streets. It, uh, during my stay in Vilno of, of a couple of decades, Vilno changed very much for better. It became much more civilized than it was when I came uh, as a child, but I, in Vilno, I uh, lived through my school years and my university years. So for me, that was a city which really uh, formed me. Uh, this I can say, of course. And for me, uh, this city mm, remained an extremely important factor in my biography. It's also a city that you return to very frequently in your writing. And I wonder what you believe the reason for that is. Well, you see, when you are, uh, uh, where you spend your childhood and your adolescence in a place it always has a great impact because our first impressions are fresh and we learn the world there. Uh, so it's obvious that I return to Vilno as to my personal capital of Im first impressions, souvenirs and, and uh, feelings. Uh, I should say that mm, in my writing, I have never been nostalgic. Uh, it doesn't mean that I would like to go back in time, but there is uh, a known phenomenon in uh, literature, in writing, a phenomenon of a distance. This is like Marcel Proust in the remembrance of, of time gone, uh, uh, was writing. It creates a certain distance and uh, aura of objectivity uh, approaching things which are no more. Uh, so I guess that largely 
because I spent a lot of time my my life in as an emigre, uh, returning to familiar places and people uh, plays a peculiar role of an anchor keeping us in the world. The same, I guess, was discovered by Isaac Bashevis Singer when he found himself in America and he was, he went through a period of literary sterility, but then he, he found his true subject, namely uh, the life of uh, Jewish Warsaw and Jewish little towns in Poland. So that was the question of distance, which, cons uh, which uh, directed my writings towards Vilna. You mentioned proof. What is your own equivalent of a Vilna or the Madeleine, so to speak? What is proof's Madeleine in terms of your returning or unlocking Vilna in your own mind? Not only Vilna. In this respect, I must mention that uh, a little valley in the center of Lithuania, in the district of Kiedaine, uh, is my true uh, childhood uh, mm, paradise, like in Proust, Combray, and the mm, environments. So, uh, mm, I should say that largely landscapes, nature of that part of Europe played a role in my writings. In speaking of Vilna, what are your best memories and your worst memories? Best memories, uh, certainly, the time of my adolescence, of our mm, parties and, and excursions in the neighborhood of Vilno. And uh, mm, I must say that, mm, unfortunately, uh, my memories, my happy memories, were spoiled by the fact that uh, Ponari was chosen as a place of execution, because Ponari, for me, uh, in my adolescence, were just forests, oak forests on the hills where we used to, to, to make our excursions and uh, celebrate our, uh, mm, our friendly feasts of the vagabond, so-called vagabond club. And the worst, worst moment, uh, I'm undoubtedly, when I was uh, in 1940, it was after the fall of France uh, when the Soviet tanks entered the uh, Cathedral Square, and I was looking at that. I understood at that moment that, uh, mm, that Vilno, as I knew it, uh, uh, was no more and for good. Then later on came events which I didn't wit witness because then I was already in Warsaw. After, soon after the invasion, uh, I decided to leave uh, Vilno and Soviet-occupied Lithuania, even though uh, I, as uh, I was considered a rather leftist, mm, some people uh, expected me to mm, collaborate with the Soviets, but I didn't want and I risked going through the so-called green frontier uh, to uh, and mm, with a danger of falling into the hands of the Germans. Uh, but somehow I reached Warsaw after crossing four border borders. You've written that Vilno was a robust Jewish cultural center with traditions. This is important to remember when we speak of Vilna. 
to a significant degree it was a Jewish city. When you were growing up, as passing your childhood, your your adolescence, your university years in Vilno, what was your your own personal relations at that time with the city's Jewish community? Well, you ask me about the Jewish Vilno and uh, uh, wh how it was at the time I grew up and whether I had some Jewish friends. You see, Vilno was a fascinating mm, city uh, of many languages and uh, denominations. Mm, uh, there, 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 there was no one Vilno. Everyone belonged to a different Vilno. If you take the schools, for instance, high schools, there were high schools teaching in Polish, in Yiddish, in Hebrew, in Russian, because there were two su such schools. Uh, uh, in, uh, there was one high school, Belarusian high school, and there was one uh, uh, Lithuanian high school, though Lithuanians are very, very few in, in Vilno. Uh, according to German statistics of 1916, uh, only two and a half percent of population spoke, uh, gave their native tongue as Lithuanian. So the majority, of course, spoke uh, either Polish or Yiddish. Uh, and uh, mm. so depend, depending in what circle you moved, you had a different perspective. Uh, mm, I suspect that people belonging to uh, the Polish-speaking uh, Vilno uh, had very little knowledge what was going on in the Jewish Vilno, and vice versa. The Jewish Vilno, uh, I, I guess, but only now I know about very rich cultural life uh, of Vilno, uh, of Jewish Vilno. Uh, so there was no mutual uh, interpenetration. Uh, let us say, take, uh, take schools. Uh, Jews would go to schools in Yiddish or Hebrew or uh, Russian, because Russian was spoken by some intelligentsia uh, from ta the Tsarist times. Very few uh, Jews would go to my high school. Uh, I had some colleagues, but very, very few rare cases, really. Uh, my, my contacts, well, you see, when I, when I was a child, we played in the yard uh, with Yashka and Sonika. Those were uh, children of a Jewish family. But their language was Russian, uh, which helped enormously my, my Russian, you know. Uh, largely due to the to uh, to those playing with Yashka and Sonka, uh, I uh, I preserved my Russian uh, from from the early childhood, uh, uh, from the First World War in in Russia. And later on, uh, I would go mm, to uh, spectacles of a, a Jewish theater in Yiddish. Mm. And of course, I had uh, numerous friends at the university. We prepared together uh, our examinations in law, usually. Those were, those were uh, Jewish boys, mostly from, from the neighboring little uh, Jewish towns near Vilno. Uh, and f and uh, Junge Vilno. Uh, you know, we had a group, literary group, uh, called Jagari. 
Uh, and uh, Jung will not visit uh, our appearances, our poetry recitals. However, I guess they were slightly younger, mostly, than our group. Uh, Abram Sutskever was one of those who, uh, uh, as he himself told me, had visiting, had been visit, attending our poetry readings. And uh, moreover, you asked me what I uh, what I owe to Vilno as a for cultural center, creating, creating, uh, creating me, forming me. Uh, I would answer the first of all the university. The university was very important factor, and at the university. Uh, there was, uh, in any case, when I was at the university, there were constant uh, battles between uh, mm, uh, nationalists, Polish nationalists, and mm, our uh, left-oriented bloc. Uh, at a given moment, it was, I guess, 1930, 33, probably, uh, we arranged uh, to counteract the influence of nationalists the evening of the poetry of revolt. Uh, international evening where poetry was recited in uh, Polish, Yiddish, Belarusian, uh, what else? Not Russian, no. Polish, Yiddish, Belarusian, I guess. Yeah. It, it was international. It, there were some Lithuanian uh, young poets too, but I don't remember any Lithuanian reciting. So in any case, that was uh, marked as an act of uh, cultural cooperation in Vilno, of international character uh, of Vilno. That's some, a, an evening that I've not heard of be before. Um, do you remember any of the Jewish poets that took, or writers that took part in that? Uh, I don't remember. What I remember very well and very vividly uh, there was a little young Jewish tailor who magnificently recited poems of Toller in Yiddish. Uh, this I remember very, very vividly. I don't remember any details other than it. Now, you mentioned... Um, because Toller at that time was a big big name uh, among the leftists in, in, in that part of Vienna. You, you mentioned several times your own leftist leanings, and one of the things that Domer is definitely associated with in the Jewish historical consciousness is as the cradle not only of the Bund, but of numerous other social and political movements. I wonder if you could tell us, as someone of Polish non-Jewish heritage, what your own, what that, the Vilna political social movements were like, and also whether there was any, beyond the evening you just described, whether w there were any times that there was an intersection between the Jewish leftist group so to speak, and let's say the non-Jewish group. Yes, but this, uh, yes, yes. There was, there was, a, mm, for instance, on the May 1st, usually there were some mm, manifestations of solidarity, but I don't know anything about that. I didn't take part in that. Uh, I guess that those were older people, that not, not, not our young movement. 
our movement was very specific because it developed uh, within the university and it came about from a movement from Roman Catholic uh, mm, circles towards the left. Uh, our leader, Henrik Dembinski, uh, started his activity as a Roman Catholic activist, uh, and then he gradually moved towards the left. Uh, and our movement was very specific. He, he became uh, gradually uh, communist. And uh, there was a split within our group. Uh, one part went as far as joining the, the, the clandestine Communist Party mm, of the of Bil Lithuanian Belarus, and uh, uh, the other part, and I belong to that, didn't follow politically. So when I use the expression leftist, it's very specific. Uh, oriented to the left, but rather mm, internationally, rather as an opposition to Polish nationalists, than uh, politically uh, uh, accepting 100% what was going on in the Stalinist Russia. Uh, because of my knowledge of Russian, I had probably better understanding of what was going on in, uh, under the Soviets than many of my colleagues. Let's stop for one second. Can we continue? Yes. As you know, Vilna was for hundreds of years a city of mythical stature in Jewish consciousness, the Jerusalem of Lithuania. As a Polish Catholic, does the city have any mythical significance to you? Well, you ask me about the mythical dimension of Vilna as a big uh, mm, Jewish center, the Jerusalem of the North and the mythical character of Catholic Vilno for me. I should say that that mythical dimension, uh, when one is young, is not perceived very clearly. It is a kind of an aura uh, which is uh, connected with certain buildings, certain traditions, and so on. For me, of course, Vilna was primarily uh, uh, that old university of mine, uh, which uh, was founded in uh, uh, 1578 as the uh, Jesuit Academy, and then transformed into university. So that old, those old buildings mm, in which I, I took my classes, and St. John's Church, the university church, all that aura uh, created uh, for me uh, the center of my uh, Vilna mythology. And uh, the names of professors, uh, after all, that was the cradle of the uh, Polish Romantic movement. Uh, Vilno is for the Poles mm, extremely mm, emotional city, much more than any city uh, in Poland proper, except maybe Krakow, uh, because it is uh, it is uh, several centuries of traditions and precisely that romantic literary movement, which for Polish literature is seminal, very important. Uh, so all, all that, not, uh, uh, not mentioning a, a very important factor that 
uh, the Protestant movement, the Calvinist movement uh, in the uh, 16th century mm, was very strong in Lithuania and in Vilno. And there were constant battles between students, uh, Catholic students and Calvinist students, uh, which is an important part of, of cultural history uh, of Poland and uh, of, uh, of, of Polish literature also. Uh, so only later on I learned about what for me was, uh, what which I was sort of drinking through the pores of my skin. Uh, the same applies to the Jewish uh, mm, Vilno. Uh, only later I learned about uh, Vilno as the, the center of opposition to Hasidism, as a mm, opposition um, uh, represented by eminent rabbis, by great Gaon, and so on. Uh, so there are two stages, I should say. First, mm, unconscious. Uh, uh, imbibing a certain aura mm, in Vilno and another conscious absorption. Uh, in any case, I noticed a very strange phenomenon that many people from Poland who go now to Vilno uh, are under its charm they don't know, they, they have difficulty in defining in what it consists. Uh, there is something in, in that place. Maybe if we read uh, some testimonies of Jewish writers, a similar feeling of an uh, undefined charm and aura can be found there. If you were to try to describe that aura, which is really the essence of, of Vilna, we've done numerous interviews, and I've been struck e even before we began our, our videotaping yes. by the persistence of Vilna, the depth of the whole, on the consciousness of primarily Jewish interviewers.